do this and make better bass lines with synths. That's going to be today's video. Are you ready for that? Let's go do it right now. Hey, welcome. I'm in Low Kitchen and thank you for checking out yet another video. Now, if this is your first time here, do not hesitate to click subscribe and hit that notification bell. Whenever I upload a new video, you'll be kept in the loop and you'll not miss out on anything. Hang around till the end of this video. I'll tell you all about Discord and Patreon, about the community. I'll tell you all about releasing music. I'll tell you all about remixing music and that kind of good stuff. So hang around for that. Also, if you find stuff interesting and you like the music, you can find some of the tracks on Bandcamp. Go and check that out. That's bandcamp.andlocation.bandcamp.com. That's the one. Yeah, go check it out. I'll also tell you towards the end of the video who the new patrons are. And I'd like to welcome all the new subscribers since the channel has really been blowing up. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time here, stay tuned and watch the show. One of the videos that really blew up was on bass arpeggios. The bass line, in my opinion, in my music, is one of the strongest parts of the sound. I think I will get to a bass line pretty fast because if I know where the bass is going, I pretty much know where everything else needs to go. So in terms of songwriting, I will look at the groove. If the groove is moving, I'll place the bass line there. It's the second most important part for me. So groove first, then the bass line second. Now, once I know the bass line, I can either steer it to a vocalist or to a guitarist or whatever and tell them like, this is my ballpark idea of where I think the track should go. Um, but the bass line is an intricate part because it does two things. To me, it really creates groove and melody, both. So once you look at the bass line as a solo instrument, that's where the bass arpeggio comes in. You'll just migrate towards getting a bass to go in an arpeggio kind of flow, which means, um, and that's not a philosophy that I have of making a long, like has me for a long time. The best house tracks or the best dance tracks that I've seen are the ones that don't house too much information. It's basically groove and one or two ingredients that go over the top, right? So there's a lead sound, there's a bass sound. Now, if you can get your track to work in that way, you're golden. I also am guilty of overproducing, so you get insecure, you don't really hear it that well, it doesn't start immediately, or the feeling is that not there, the flow's not there, life gets in the way, whatever. Sometimes something happens uh, that you think you need to add more and stick more in there. So what happens is that you pass the point of really looking at it critically, like, is this really going to work? Does this really have to? be on this track and there's a lot of tracks even that that are being released that sound like full or congested or whatever it's a bit of a standard now in order to, for your track to work you have to simplify stuff once more now there's a few tricks that i'm going to show you today on how i think a bass line could work how you can surprise yourself and get yourself into that mojo of like making music and yeah getting just to a good point now it doesn't really matter what synthesizer you use. It should just be uh, the character of the bass sound that should work in conjunction with the beats that you have created. Now, if not anything else, if you're ready, fasten your seatbelts, buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy bass ride. Let's go do it. Let's do it now. Now, when you work this bass line, there's more than just the bass line that goes into play. Now, listen to what I have right here. The drums are playing this. All right, I've got a sim simple kick drum. The kick drum does what it needs to do. It's all nice. Well, okay, this is sweet. You should not worry about this. This kick, however, needs to consist of a few elements. And what I um, usually tend to do is I'll just uh, uh, tell you on how I set that up. Now, first, I've got a mini tar that's going to take care of bass duties. The Akai MPC Live is the branded situation. The Acid Box 3, and then there's a mini log XD right here. Now, I've set this thing up. Um, Beforehand, there's a fast arpeggio, there's a slow arpeggio. And that means that there's musical elements that are moving in the middle of the track. So you will definitely hear how that is going to work with the level straight. Now, the meter goes into the digital delay here, then goes out of the black sky and then the black sky onto the desk. The Akai goes straight to the desk. What I've done though is um, uh, I have rooted, uh, I put three and four into the acid box and then I've rooted the acid box back into the Akai. So on my um, sampler page, 
uh, I put it on record monitoring so I can hear whatever comes in, which means I've got an initially an extra input on the AKI that I don't have to use. I use it for sampling, but at the same time, I'm just using it as an audio through. There's something coming already. You can see that the levels are playing. However, since the stereo output is not being engaged on the desk, you will not hear what is playing. That's going to happen in a second. And why I've done that is because you can save yourself a lot of um, channels. If you don't have a mixer that you want to bring to the stage, this could easily be stuck on the disco mixer, right? So it's a stereo out here. There's a, stereo, there's a mono out here for the kick. That's separately and a crackling and a fader. And that's where the rest of the drums are. Cool, now I will go into the normal setting. I have got uh, four sequences for one track aligned, but I will go into the most busiest uh, of the sequences of the patterns so that you will hear how this metabolizes. I have a tom that's sitting on top of the drums already as part of the chord structure. So you can hear without the kick. There's a small ride that I use as a crash, which is an impact. And this whole thing goes over eight bars. So, seven, two, three, four, eight, two, one, three, and that's the crash again. So that's what my kick does, right? Cool. There's different ways on how you can, can, can uh, uh, do this. If I'm gonna mute my um, tom, so there's two tracks also that I use for drums. This is just a kick drum, this one, as you can hear solo. And then the second track that I have here is just the rest of the drums. So I have to go into this program, which is here. I will go into my pad mixer or pad mute or whatever, pad mixer. And then you can see what all the elements are doing. So that's where my 16th are. And this is orange instead of uh, bright red, which means that this pad is playing at 50% of its velocity. Now, the tom is sitting over here. I can now turn it down some more. Or I can even say, mute it completely. I've muted it, so now you hear what the, what the drums are doing. It's basically boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap. So nothing too complicated. The tom is there to start the groove already. Now, this is where you can add some um, some groove if you would like to. I have not put some shuffle on there because I tend to just like not shuffle the groove up too much there because I will just mix it down or at least um, level it down to the point where it's still doing its low end frequency content thing, but it's not going to interfere with the rest of the drums because with the rest of the bass line because this is already a bass note as you can hear. Now, let's see what one of those arpeggios is doing. The arpeggio is coming from the Akai, because I would wanted to keep it simple today. This is the arp. You can hear that the tom is in the same key, is it? I think it is. Just go in and say, okay, woo. Go back to the drums. We'll go and say, add a tempo. No, there you go. That was, this is better. With shift, I can do it with smaller increments. So I'll pitch it so that it sits within the beat. It was one uh, semi turn up. It might be seven in a second. You never know. Cool. This is working. Now, in terms of the faster arpeggio, which is being played by the Mini Log XD, that plays this. Well, the release on the sound is open so that it makes a blanket of sound already. I'm level it in. So now it gives me ample room to do whatever I want to do. Something is playing also on the acid box, which is uh, a, yeah, some sort of a ravey lead, which plays this. And go back out. See? So, 
another element. Now, now it's time to focus on that baseline, right? Okay, what we're going to do is, I've got my baseline sitting right here. It determines on whether you want to play long notes or shorter notes. Make it a little bit louder so that you can make it clear here. Now for a, a, a thing like this, right? Take this arp out and go back. Because now you know the music is playing, you got a mental imprint of what's happening, right? So take it up. Arp is playing. Okay, so now the mini. Go here. Two. Now, in order to make a funky, groovy bass line that complements the beat, don't start on the one. Just try and focus on what is playing, and that tom is a bit of a problem maybe, but try and find spaces or spots in between where notes are playing. So, you can even think like, I will double this. Now the reason that this bass line works is because on the first measure of the bar there's nothing playing. One, two, one. So there's a nice of breathing kind of vibe that's happening. There's a little bit of room. So when you play a bass line there, it doesn't really take away. Now you can either go in and do that on the same thing, like I said. One, two. One, two. One, two. Now groove in my mind is always after the beat, so it always plays in a different kind of vibe. Now if you want to do a call and response with the tom that's already playing, say you're like, dude, I went all the way to the Himalayas to get the best tom ever, I want people to hear it, I'm not going to stick a bass line on top of it, then you got room to play something in the beginning of the measure, right? Now, da 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 I love the vibe, but this is a different bass sound, right? So... Let's go in and make it a little bit more of, an, of, a, of a melodic techno bass, which means that less percussive, longer notes. So can you see how this bass line now can be two different things? So from the minute I think like, okay, I need it to be more percussive, turn down the filter, a little bit of envelope generation, a little bit less of release. We're gonna start to introduce this thing here. That's, you wanna play this bass line according to what's playing right here. But let's still stay with the shorter bass note and see what we can do. Right? And this works because then this is following this, so it's giving a little bit of a push. Let's see what happens if we play that arp with it, right? So then you start to see how this is going to make sense. Since we've got a lead thing here, I'm going to take that lead frequency, that mid-range, that growliness out of this thing. So we have the arp play a little bit more of a theme, very 80s. You can hear that now both of them are drowning each other out, which is cool, very modern, very now. But if you want to go for that 80s kind of vibe, that retro vibe, you'll just have to make a frequency window. So to space it out, you've got the arc sitting here and you'll just have this one sitting there as well. You'll move the pad out of the way of the arc. So the frequencies of the arpeggio are sitting above it. Then with this Acid Box 3 that I've got right here, it's a very cool filter. I can really pinpoint what frequency I would like to 
use. So let's stick it here for now and focus on that bass line again. Go back to the bass, obviously. You yeah, idiot. Okay, man. Okay, lower this. And then on the same chord. Okay, now we're going to play this, we're going to record it, and I'm going to change the sound so that this bass line becomes a melodic techno bass line underneath, just by changing the envelopes. First, let's record it in, as we go. Who's dancing? Who's bobbing their head? Ah, come on. Okay, cool. Now, now the song is starting to become something, right? Okay, take out the kick and in with the pad. Kick out. One, two, three, in. So very funky, it's a little bit more of a housey vibe. Now we want to make it more melodic, right? Okay, cool. Now, lower this filter, check this out. Still not finished, fixed enough. Now it's still playing the notes, but because I lagged the um, envelope, now it becomes more of a, got more character underneath. Let's take this out. Take out the filter envelope as well, so now it's just long notes, right? Now, to make it even more space, now you're going to use that fast arpeggio, so stick the mini log in there. Filter it up a bit. Create a dramatic impact. That's why I love just sticking my drums on two faders. One, two, three, semi-drop, just a kick. Taking out this arm and going back on the sound. See? Now, this is what I really, really like. Now this works with most um, uh, synthesizers, uh, bass synths that have this sort of an impact. I don't want to make it too complicated with too many oscillators. There's two here. As you can see, I can still tweak up the other oscillator, which we can probably do. Let's take this out, this out. Go to the ARP and say ARP, shut up. Okay, now we just got the bass and the drums. So if you want to re-space it out, that's another thing that you can do. Say like, okay, so on a live performance, right? All these things, if you can get them under your belt, it's a very powerful tool because you can just like space this track out to be 15 minutes long even, if you would want to. So again, filter envelope down a little bit. Release open, envelope generation gone. Now we're gonna re-space it out a little bit. Listen to this, just detune one oscillator. The reese bass is usually longer or lower. So I'll go in to the bass line and say like, let's down this by 12 notes. There you go. Get that reese kind of vibe going. 
Now we'll play around with this sound here on the filter, like so. See how now the whole track just changes into a little bit more of an underground kind of vibe, which is personally what I like. But you can see how this is a way to just really be versatile with the bass line. Now I've tried it, it depends. Now why on earth would you have to use a bass line? Most people have a set it, forget it kind of vibe with a bass line and I understand it, I get it. But you have to understand, sometimes you get into a different situation where you do not know beforehand how your performance is going to turn out at all. It can be a little bit more percussive. Percussion gives a little bit more speed to the track, I would say. So if I'm playing this, Focus on the tom that we played earlier. Now see if I, if, if, even if I shorten my envelope more. Now we've got a tom right here, right? We've got a, some sort of a tom thing. Let's open it up a little bit more. So to make a tom, filter it down and have a little bit more of the um, percussive effects going. See? Envelope generation, very important. So you, you look for where the sound starts to become a little, a little bit more than a drum, than a bass sound. Go that here. Something here, yeah, yeah. The lower notes are better because the higher notes give away that it's a bass line. But if you would stay on the same um, uh, root note, if you played ostinato, meaning, uh, then this. So you can see where you can go. I would prefer to just like start my track something like this. Or a drop. Take out the kick drum. Start to enter the music. But do you see how I use my music as a blanket, as some sort of an atmospheric thing to just like send you off into oblivion, you know? Because most of the time my audience tends to be standing in front of the speaker and they'll, <laughs> they'll stand there for a while as they... Um, Hear the angels sing most of the time. That's just this, this, the nature of this music. So you would love to invoke more uh, adrenaline, more emotion. So that's the way we do it. So, all right, kick in, drums in. Nice. So you got ample things to work with, right? Now, this is giving me uh, jitters. So we need the other arp to help us out. And the arp is over here. So make a beat. Two, three, four, five, six, play. So this one is on, what is it? Those are eights, right? Yeah. And those are sixteenths. Okay, lengthen my bass note again. Playing around with a decay. The attack is all the way to the bottom because I want my sound to start straight, you know what I mean? I'm gonna filter this down because it takes a little bit too much attention. That's a mini log XD. And while I'm filtering this down, I'm filtering the mini tower up. There you go. Kick out. I feel the transition going with the pads. Those pads, by the way, are Coming out of a, this is coming out of a sample pack, right? This is just one sort of like melodic techno drone sound that I found that I stuck it in here. And then I play the sounds with, you know, I play the, um, the, 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 the melody with that thing. Let's, I'll show you how I've done that. Bad soul. So I'll go in, I'll say, I think it's here. Yeah, it's over there. So it's all sitting here, put it on 60 levels so you got the different Things going, starts again, we say edit samples, yes. Now, the sound had a really weird sort of like envelope during the beginning. It went like, so, it was like somebody was stepping on a frog, and I was like, no, please, no. So, I took out the beginning, but if you listen to it, it's longer than you think. 
And what I've done is I took the auto fire off there. So usually if you hit a pad, it will go all the way. Uh, but because it's such a long sample, and if I put the uh, one shot on, whenever I switch to a different sequence, it's really going to just like screw in my hand and just keeps playing, which is not ideal, especially if you're changing a different track, because this is the last of my um, uh, patterns, as you can see here. Uh, so it means that I will move over to 3.1 here. One, two, three, three, one two, three, four, that's how the song is. So I'll definitely make my tracks into these four things. So this is my transition um, uh, already. So if I was to accidentally go to the next track, which I don't know what it is. Ah, there you go. A completely different track, which means now if this thing keeps hanging. See what I mean? So that's why I made sure that it just like doesn't play all the way through. Now. Um, that's how that works. I'll go back into my, um, what else I was going to tell you about the bass. So how to build this up, right? Because, um, um, the sound that I've used is, it's not too difficult, really, basically, you know, uh, one is a saw, one is a square. Uh, that's how I set this sound up. I've made this sound on, uh, the editor, which comes with the mini tower. If you buy a mini tower, uh, you have an editor, which is cool because it folds out. There's more knobs on this than you can actually see. Uh, it really works well. You have to just like uh, do different things. There's sync on there. There's like uh, completely different things you can do with the synthesizer. More powerful than you think. The mini tower, I think is a bit of an underrated synthesizer, but people that have one own one know this thing inside out they know what it can do in terms of bass this is the one so uh, i've edited the sound and the sound sounds like uh, what i said it's not too it's not that's not that bass it's this mini now, i love these kinds of round tennis ball so kind of bass sounds What's not to like there, right? So, if you're savvy, you want this sound, you can sample it now. Want a longer sound? I'll give you a longer sound. There you go. I mean, don't, don't act like you never sampled anything off YouTube. All right, cool, now this is my bass sound. We'll see if I can make it available for uh, the patrons as well later in the in the week. Now, um, I guess that that is that. Um, I build up the track. I make my drums first because there is an ABC structure on how I work my tracks. First, I will start with the drums, right? So I'll find a kick drum to me. It's very, very uh, uh, analog kitchen, stupid foolproof for me. I'm, I start with this. And I keep searching until I got the right kick drum. This is how it works. If I don't find the right kick drum, I will probably not even move on. So this is the first thing that needs to happen for me in my uh, simple brain, right? So um, I've got the EQ here and I can take out certain things so you can hear what it does. Now, this kick drum is consists of multiple sounds. So there's the ta, 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 the letter T. There's a cross between the letter D and the letter T, there's some high frequency on there that makes it even more aggressive. And then obviously there's this low end. Now, as I said before, a desk like this works best if you drive it a little bit. Um, it's not the most expensive desk there is in the world, but um, uh, that means that if you overdrive it, it uh, starts to sound great. And I don't think if you got an API 1604 that you would love to do this. <laughs> but you can do it on a desk like this. So, so here is moderately sounding, right? And here, you can hear that the desk introduces a little bit of character. Now, blinking, good. Always on, bad, yeah? So that's how you should look at that. Okay, the rest of the drums in. Oh no, the bass line first. Let's get the bass line. Now you can hear how powerful this bass line is. Now, people who ask me, you don't mix anything because you can see this is all straight. This is also all straight. I don't really mix anything. How come your frequencies don't clash? Well, they do, actually. You can hear here that, bam, there the kick is gone and here. Not here, here and there. 
Now, but because of this sound having, this is when you start to introduce trouble most of the time, if you keep it this low. See, now it starts to fight with the kick drum. Not too much because on the kick drum I've got also different things happening. So this kick drum, I took it because there's different things in there. If it was this, that I keep hearing with a lot of people, then obviously you're going to use a lot of um, sound into the space line. So you would need to have a little bit of character there. So what happens is that if I'm opening up the filter a little bit more, that growly business, wow, 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 that this also invokes this diode that I've got on the cable, make sure that Okay, there's a portion of the frequency that's overlapping with the kick drum, but not everything, right? So you'll hear that it clashes, but your mind tends to think, hey, it's a more pleasing sound than uh, stuff that's not working. But if you were to look on a, uh, at this on a scope, you'll see that things are not really the way this was supposed to be by the letter of the law, but there's no law in making music, right? Cool, out, off you go, in with the drums. Michiel Thomassen and Flexi Smulitz are the new patrons for this week. They're following me on patreon.com slash analog kitchen. Thank you very much. Now, if you don't know, Patreon is a support platform where you can become a patron by uh, donating a small amount, uh, which can get you certain perks. Now, the lowest uh, tier is uh, getting me a coffee each month, which is uh, tasty because I love my coffee. And then it gradually goes up and you still won't be breaking the bank. And out of this whole patronage, um, which started slowly, has now erupted a nice community as I have connected Patreon to Discord and on Discord. That's where I think most of the magic happens when we talk to each other, when we do after video chats, when we talk about gas, where we just like come up with challenges. Hmm. Nice uh, leading because um, one of the challenges was a January slash February um, challenge where I uh, told the uh, people on the on the on the Discord make a synth wave techno kind of vibe. Now there's a lot of cool tracks that came out. I saw uh, Brian do something. Rodas track was pretty good. I saw Furniture's track that was pretty good. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to give it to Brad. F. He's did uh, a track called Open Voice, which really, really uh, spoke to me. I love the, uh, the the sound of it. It's some sort of a modern classic, I would say. So, uh, Brad F, congratulations. Thank you. You have won that challenge. Now, you will win a few one-on-ones with me. We're going to go in-depth into your production structure, and I'll help you out. And maybe even once you've got a track done, I'll mix and master that for you. So that's a, a cool thing. So it goes to Perth in Australia. That's cool. Um, well, um, if you made it this far in the video, you're an absolute superstar. This is my take on bass lines. I mean, I do a lot of bass line videos uh, because I do think it's one of the most important pillars in your music. I see it's an overlooked thing on most uh, people's tracks and I just don't tend to not play tracks. I just don't play them if the bass line's not produced well or even if it's too loud you know so there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in the terms of the baseline department let me know on how you work your baseline don't be a stranger leave a comment in the section below um, if not join up on patreon as i said so you get access to uh, the chat after this video and um, let's see if we can uh, mumble wrap our way into some more synth talk and if not anything else if you never know where to go and if you're not sure how to pitch your tunes you can always pitch everything seven semitones up that's the case all right uh this is analog kitchen i'm out i'll catch you on the rebound peace <laughs>